Today's reading is from Isaiah chapter 5, verses 1 through 7 in the Old Testament. The prophet sings a sad, parable-like love song about the relationship between God and Israel. In this song, Israel is compared to a promising vineyard. Despite God's loving care, the vineyard that is Israel has brought forth wild grapes of injustice and distress when fine grapes of justice and righteousness were expected. The reading begins at verse 1. Let me sing for my beloved my love song concerning his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it and cleared it of stones and planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it and hewed out a vine vat in it. He expected it to yield grapes, but it yielded wild grapes. And now inhabitants of Jerusalem and people of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I had not done in it? When I expected it to yield grapes, why did it yield wild grapes? And now I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedge and it shall be devoured. I will break down its wall and it shall be trampled down. I will make it a waste. It shall not be pruned or hoed and it shall be overgrown with briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the people of Judah are his pleasant planting. He expected justice, but saw bloodshed, righteousness, but heard a cry. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Gospel according to Matthew, the 21st chapter. Jesus tells a parable to the religious leaders who are plotting his death revealing that their plans will, ironically, bring about the fulfillment of Scripture. The reading begins at verse 33. Jesus said to the people, Listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he leased it to tenants and went to another country. When the harvest time had come, he sent his slaves to the tenants to collect his produce. But the tenants seized his slaves and beat one killed another, and stoned another. Again, he sent other slaves, more than the first, and they treated them in the same way. Finally, he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and get his inheritance. So they seized him, threw him out of the vineyard, and killed him. Now when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? They said to him, He will put those wretches to a miserable death and lease the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the produce at the harvest time. Jesus said to them, Have you never read in the scriptures the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone? This was the Lord's doing, and it is amazing in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people that produces the fruits of the kingdom. The one who falls in this stone will be broken to pieces, and it will crush anyone on whom it falls. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, they realized that he was speaking about them. They wanted to arrest him, but they feared the crowds because they regarded him as a prophet. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. prophet Isaiah lived 700 years before Jesus, but these two texts for today from Isaiah 5 and Matthew 21 are so closely connected that we must keep both in mind this morning. By choosing a parable about the vineyard, Jesus is hauling out the heavy artillery from Isaiah. Everybody knew that parable. Our scripture for today tells a story of God's judgment and God's grace. The judgment sounds the loudest. But the grace is there too if you look for it. Here's the concern. What fruit does God expect from those who call themselves God's people? And especially if they're leaders of God's people. The prophet Isaiah, to begin with, 
put it this way, to Israel's ruling elite. It's not going well. And he tells a parable that starts off as a kind of a love ballad to God and God's people pictured as a vineyard. Vineyards, of course, were very familiar and highly prized. And Isaiah starts out by describing how God built it. You know, fertile hillside, dug and cleared stone, planted the choicest vines, puts hedges and gates to keep the animals out, a watchtower, a wine press. And now God looks expectantly after the uh, a time for good grapes. It's bad. It's bitter. The grapes are wild and sour, depending on the translation. And then God asks, what more could have been done for my vineyard than was done for it? I looked for good grapes. Why did it yield only bad? A farmer doesn't keep a vineyard around that produces such grapes. So the hedges and the walls will come down and it will not be cultivated anymore and animals will eventually trample over it and briars and weeds will grow on it. And those are all things that would happen naturally, but you kind of know God's in here when he says, and God will command that the clouds will not rain on it either. And then does Isaiah delivers the punchline. He says, all the men and women of Judah are the vineyard God was so proud of. He looked for a crop of justice and saw them murdering each other. He looked for a harvest of righteousness and heard only the moans of the victims. I quoted there from a paraphrase by Eugene Peterson. And that's where our passage ends. Read further, though, and you get a description of what was happening in the society of Israel. The rich were buying up the houses and grabbing all the land for themselves and evicting old owners because they could. And many in the country were landless and homeless. And then they were erecting big mansions over large regions of land that they owned. Some were drinking from the early hours of the morning, late at night, and planning extravagant banquets and parties that had all of the fancy flutes and harps and plenty of fine wine, but they paid no attention to the work of God. And the accusation is that you use lies to sell evil by the truckload, to put it in the words of Eugene Peterson, and you imagine that God is there for your pleasure. And you call evil good, and good evil. And you have such a high opinion of yourself, even while you're lining your pockets with bribes from the guilty and violating the rights of the innocent. What is being described here is the exact opposite of the society that would come from the heart of God. It's the opposite of what we sometimes call servant leadership, which was really taught by Jesus. Well, judgment will come on this on its own, partly. Soul's atrophy, arrogant pli uh, pride blinds, truth and justice are lost, and so greed just goes crazy. But the most shocking image of all to me is when the poetry says it this way, God whistles to Assyria to come quickly. That's a, a, a ruthless superpower. Like one would whistle for a dog and say, sick. And biblical judgment always falls the hardest on leaders who should know better and have the power to do right but hide behind the facade of righteousness and religion while exploiting, not protecting, those most vulnerable in the society or the church. <laughs>
which brings us 700 years later to Jesus and his parable, which is a parable of judgment and grace. If you recall, he tells the, of a vineyard, only there's a little twist to this one. The owner of a vineyard rents it out to tenants who withhold what is due to the owner and disrespect and brutalize his servants, finally killing his son, who he sends, hoping they will at least honor him. And of course, the vineyard owner is clearly God, represents God in the parable, who seems really foolish to risk his son on a mission so to such wicked tenants. Of course, by this time, Jesus knows He's, when he tells the parable, he knows that the religious leaders to whom he's speaking are plotting his death. They don't publicly arrest him because many people regard Jesus as a true prophet. What Jesus is really describing in his judgment of them is also, if you look for it, God's amazing patience and grace in sending the Son. And Jesus knows, too, that that means him, and he will be killed. This he knows in the telling, and it may seem foolish to us to be so vulnerable. But I want to read from uh, a story that uh, Kenneth Bailey relates. He came to hear the story and then checked it out with a intelligence officer in the American intelligence officer who confirmed it and it's a story about the willingness to be vulnerable in an extremely dangerous situation and it's told of a rather remarkable Jordanian king named King um, King Hussein et alt et tala um, around 1980 and I'll, I'll read uh, a quote from his telling. Um, the king, uh, there, there is a group of 75 uh, army officers who are plotting to overthrow the government and install in it a military dictatorship. And word of this gets to King Hussein and his army, and so his army officers will ask uh, we would like to surround the barracks where they're plotting this and arrest them and uh, prevent the coup. But uh, King Hussein has another idea and he asks for a helicopter to let him off on the roof of the barracks. And then he tells the uh, people in the helicopter, if you hear shots, just leave. And he walks down. Um, the two flights of stairs into the room where the officers are meeting. And I'll read what he says. Gentlemen, he says, it has come to my attention that you're meeting here tonight to finalize your plans to overthrow the government, take over the country and install a military dictatorship. If you do this, the army will break apart and the country will be plunged into a civil war. Tens of thousands of innocent people will die. There is no need for this. Here I am. Kill me and proceed. That way, only one man will die. After a moment of stunned silence, <laughs> The rebels as one rushed forward to kiss the king's hand and feet and pledge loyal to him, loyalty to him for their whole life. Hussein meets the crisis with vulnerability. And this is also God's way. In the parable, the owner sends his son because he believes the tenants will feel shame at the son coming because they lived in an honor and shame society where you would normally respect somebody like that, even if you hated them. Um, they don't in the parable. Neither did they to Jesus. 
But ever since, the world over, the path Jesus took and his noble vulnerability instead of vengeance has appealed to the consciences now of billions. Where Jesus was acting in love and transforming by grace. So I ask the question we asked at the very beginning. Does God expect good fruit from our lives? And the answer is yes. And we can summarize that in many ways, but of course you have heard. Uh, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, and your neighbor as yourself. Or the words of uh, Micah where he says, Do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with your God. And that kind of sums up where the heart is. And from that, all kinds of fruits that lead in a very different direction than greed or avarice or envy or a host of things that the prophet was denouncing. And certainly Jesus did. As a matter of fact, when he warned his disciples, how do you tell the difference between a true prophet, a true teacher, and a false one? He said, don't go by their words. You will know them by their fruits. But does that mean that our fruits are what make us worthy of God? Is that why God loves us? And the answer is no. Good fruit is an evidence of God's work within us and our willingness to be open to that work. As Martin Luther put it, a good tree, a good, good fruit does make, not make a tree good. A good tree makes good fruit. So Jesus, yes, Jesus accepts us for who we are, as we are. But he does not say, seek to leave us as we were. It begins in the heart. Yes, when we seek God, we seek to know God's will. We seek to um, repent of that which is wrong within us, and we try to practice things. But when God is working within us, what also begins to happen is from time to time, we take actual delight in doing the right thing, even if it's hard. Joy comes out of that, and we come to see that God is working God's grace through us. And uh, there is probably nothing that will give a deeper satisfaction for one's meaning in life, the fruit that it produces. This parable, it's certainly a warning against hiding behind a religious facade as one's heart is hardening and one's spiritual eyes are darkening, pretending that everything is all right when in fact you're really operating in a way that is deaf to the voice of God. And this applies to the individual. It can apply to churches. It can apply to whole societies. I think it's always provocative. But one thing is clear, God does not want to be represented by religious organizations or religious people that are simply using him to cover for what is a life that is not bearing the fruits of the Spirit. A provocative thought for us. Amen.